and thank you very much for joining our online talk, Insects in the City. My name is Geraldine and I work in the Education Department at the National Museum of Ireland Natural History. Uh, we, are very much, uh, we very much hope you are enjoying National Biodiversity Week and that you are getting to not only join events like this, but that you're also getting a chance, chance to explore some nature as well. So today's broadcast is a closed YouTube live event with a pre-recorded talk on our six-legged neighbours that will last about 20 minutes. We will then be back here for a live Q&A and the entire event will be posted online at a later stage so that you can re-watch it or use it as a reference tool or perhaps even share it with some friends and family that might be interested. If you would like to ask a question, please use the chat feature on YouTube and please be aware that to post a question, you will need to have a YouTube account. And uh, we will try and get through as many questions as we can today in the 10 minutes that we have. So today's talk is by the museum's one and only entomology curator, Dr. Aidan O'Hanlon. So hi, Aidan, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, how are you? Good, Jerry. how are you? Good, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit more about our very large insect collection at the museum and specifically learning about Ireland's urban biodiversity. So thanks, Mill. Yeah, it's good timing. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Well, anyway, we're going to go straight into Aidan's pre-recorded talk now. So afterwards, we'll both be back here for the live Q&A. So we'll see you then. See you soon. Hello, everyone. My name is Aidan O'Hanlon. I'm the curator of entomology at the National Museum of Ireland. Entomology being the study of insects, it's my great privilege to look after our collection of about a million insect specimens. So these are uh, collections that have never been on display uh, to the public in our uh, museum building, the Natural History Museum in Dublin. Um, there are insects on display there, of course, but this is our, our, what we call a, re a research collection or a working reference collection. And it's used to support biodiversity research. So this is namely research uh, in the field of taxonomy, which is the naming uh, and unraveling of the evolutionary relationships among and between species, or what we call biogeography, which is studying the distributional patterns of species, where different species have been recorded from, has their distribution pattern changed over time and that sort of thing. So biodiversity very much is our bread and butter in the natural history division, uh, which is why I was delighted when JR asked me to give a talk during Biodiversity Week about urban biodiversity, and in particular about urban insects. Biodiversity uh, is short for biological diversity, and it's basically, it just means the total diversity of organisms on the planet. To some people, biodiversity might conjure up images of beautiful, colorful jungle animals like these scarlet macaws. To others, if you mentioned Irish biodiversity, they might think of a really charismatic creature like poor El Fungi the dolphin. Um, to others, to me included, uh, when I hear biodiversity, I use it as a stand-in term, really, to mean insects. Um, and it's reasonably so. We think that something like up to 90% of all insect species on the planet uh, is one form of, it, of an insect or another. And even in Ireland, insects make up 80% of our fauna. And more impressively, insects make up over 50% of Ireland's total biodiversity, uh, which means there are more kinds of insect in Ireland than all other organisms put together. So in Ireland, that would include other species of animals and fungi and plants and everything else. So insects are, are massively diverse. And they're relatively simple creatures too. Um, so insects are six-legged animals, usually with two pairs of wings. Their body is divided up into three main obvious segments, being the head, which contains the antennae and eyes and mouth parts, the thorax, which has the legs and if present, the wings, and the abdomen, which is um, which contains the uh, the reproductive organs. So this three segmented body plan is very simple, but it's the most successful body plan to have ever evolved, and it's allowed insects to evolve into somewhere between one and fifteen million different species that occupy almost every single habitat on the planet, except for the ocean op open oceans. In Ireland, insect species richness is greatest in natural environments, which is probably obvious enough. So places like woodlands, flower meadows coastal sand dunes, wetlands, bogs, and so on. But if you go deeper down the rabbit hole that you find, you'll, you'll find that features within these habitats are particularly important. So one example, if you look at this bottom right photo, this is a leaf miner. And this is uh, this is a species of caterpillar or, or wasp larva or something uh, that lives just inside the leaf. 
Um, so inside the, the tissue of the leaf, and it'll eat its way out, leaving this feeding gallery behind. Um, even more bizarrely then, on the top right, you've got something like a parasitic wasp or a parasitoid wasp. Um, in this case, she's after this cinnabar moth caterpillar, um, and the wasp, the photo on the top right, this is, will lay her egg inside the caterpillar, and her egg will then develop into a larva that will crawl around inside the living caterpillar, uh, eating the soft tissues, and eventually, like a scene out of Alien, it'll eat its way out and, and life goes on. But the point being that that wasp's life cycle is reliant upon the caterpillar living in a certain place on a certain plant species. In this case, it's ragwort. In a certain habitat type, it's pollinated by other insects and and so on. And the point being that insect life cycles and insect ecology is, is extremely complicated and is also extremely sensitive to disturbance. So typically where you'll find the greatest diversity of insect species will be in well-balanced natural ecosystems. But it must be said that there are a, ha a small handful of very interesting species that have adapted to life in the least natural environments on the planet, which of course are our giant mega cities and um, that are teeming with, with huge human populations. And these are the species that I'll be talking about for the next few minutes. An obvious example of an urban insect would be something like cockroaches. We think that there are maybe 5,000 different species of cockroach on the planet, and most of them are actually quite beneficial and play important roles in doing things like breaking down leaf litter, recycling nutrients into the soil in forest environments and so on. Only about 20 species of this 5,000 have adapted to life alongside humans in our urban environments. But these are probably the 20 most uh, hated and detested insects on the planet. Urban cockroaches have replaced scavenging on dead leaves to scavenging on just about any kind of waste that people throw out. Because they eat just about anything, they can also spread diseases like E. coli and salmonella, and people can develop allergies to substances in their exoskeletons. So you can see from the appearance of these two cockroaches on the top, this is an American cockroach, which is actually an African species. It was brought to America during the transatlantic slave trade in the 1700s, and it was named from American species or from American specimens, but the species itself originates in, in tropical Africa. And the species on the bottom here is the German cockroach, which likewise isn't German. It originates in Southeast Asia. Um, and if you look at these specimens, they've got very greasy, uh, waxy exoskeletons, um, which some people develop allergies to. The substances in it but these are actually they contain chemicals to keep the uh, to keep the cockroaches from drying out in in hot environments which is why you often find them in humid areas in, in our cities so believe it or not we've had at least six species of cockroach recorded in ireland which include the american cockroach and most commonly the german cockroach um irish cockroaches have been recorded from nearly every county and they're usually in damp constantly warm environments which suits the cockroaches perfectly of course they most commonly uh, turn up in places like kitchens, bakeries, restaurants, hospitals, hotels, factories and warehouses. But because of our colder weather, cockroaches can't survive the winter outdoors. They used to be a lot more common in Ireland. And in fact, I recently found a drawer of old typewritten responses to cockroach related inquiries, which date from sometime between the 1930s and the 1960s. So somebody from the public would find a cockroach and send it into the museum in something like a cigarette box or, or a matchbox or something like that. Um, and then a member of the museum staff would send them back one of these stock responses to save their own time because they were so common. They couldn't write this out every single time is, is what I'm assuming. And the stock responses go something along the lines of, dear sir, thank you for the specimen. It is a blank species of cockroach, uh, blah, blah, blah. These creatures can be eradicated in the following manner or something like that. Um, Presumably, in improved hygiene standards in places like hotels and restaurants um, and kitchens and so on means that we don't see cockroaches as often in our Irish cities these days as we used to. Probably no one will mourn the decline of Irish cockroaches, but another urbanite that has uh, probably entirely vanished from Ireland since around the same time period, the 50s and 60s, is the house cricket, which is a lot more likable than the cockroach. They used to be extremely common in Irish homes uh, where they would often be found near an open hearth or fireplace. The families would keep burning for most of the day. Many people would have welcomed the house cricket as a friendly guest because they sing a lovely song, um, which is what the males do. They stridulate to produce a high-pitched chirping noise, which attracts a female mate. They're probably long-standing guests in Ireland. They, we, we reckon they might have been brought to uh, Britain in the 13th century, possibly with 
crusaders returning from the Holy Lands and have lived in Ireland presumably for almost as long. They started to decline between the 20s and really 50s and 60s because of increased domestic hygiene, of course, uh, and they've, they've all, but, all but been eradicated ever since, but uh, quite a nice long-standing visitor that we did have. Slightly more annoying are these itchy urban insects. The first one here on the top left is a bed bug, and it's one of the most annoying insects in the world because it feeds on your blood when you're asleep and you'll wake up covered in extremely itchy bites, um, but you can't find the culprit because it's migrated back down inside the mattress or pillow or something like that. They're actually pretty rare in Ireland nowadays, and infestations are very easily killed off with insecticides, but they do still turn up in Ireland occasionally because they're absolutely expert at hitchhiking on luggage and things like that. So they're most often found with people um, who've returned back from holidays and in hotel rooms and things like that. The next itchy insect here uh, on the bottom left is a head louse, which would be familiar to lots of people. And um, their eggs are the little pearly white oval shaped things that we call nits, and you comb through uh, you comb through somebody's hair with a nit comb to look for the eggs. They're not entirely harmless, and they can spread disease. Uh, so things like louse-borne typhus and louse-borne relapsing fever. And also because of the itchiness, somebody scratching their head uh, like mad could open up a wound and give themselves a secondary infection like impetigo. But they have been treated very successfully with things like lice shampoo. Um, but they do still thrive and spread as localized head lice epidemics where people congregate in close quarters. So nowadays that's most often uh, in schools where kids tend to be crawling all over each other um, and they get their heads full of nits sometimes if there is an outbreak. But contrary to popular belief, Head lice do prefer clean and washed hair, and they're in no way a sign of bad hygiene or anything like that. Another itchy annoyance up on the top right uh, is the human flea. And yes, that's right, we do have our own special flea species. The human flea has been traveling around with people ever since, uh, well, since well before we were people. So I suppose in that sense, human fleas have been on just as long an interesting and evolutionary journey as, as human beings have. And they're not also not very common these days because we have massively improved hygiene standards, uh, certainly over the last couple of decades. And it's thought that things like vacuum cleaning um, has all but eradicated the, the juvenile forms of these in households. So there's less of them around to infect people. But it doesn't really matter because we still have cat fleas and dog fleas. Um, in Ireland, dog fleas are particularly common. Um, in Britain, it's thought to be the other way around. Cat fleas are the more common one, which is kind of interesting. They'll both make your life miserable just by making you extremely itchy. But in the grand scheme of things, they're, they're fairly harmless. They're just very, very annoying. Here's a genuinely harmful flea. This is the oriental rat flea. This is the species responsible for transmitting a bacterium called Yersinia pestis, black rats to human beings. The bacteria multiply in human lymph nodes until they swell and burst, which overwhelms the immune system and causes death within a couple of days, usually five days or so. This is, of course, uh, the bubonic plague that I'm describing, which was a mostly urban disease of medieval Europe that wiped out between 75 to 200 million people. In Ireland, it first showed up via trade ships in our large urban centres on the East Coast, places like Drogheda, Wexford and Dublin, and it spread around from there. The devastation caused by the Black Death was, the worst, um, was worse in cities because the rat populations in cities are greatest, where there are lots of humans, and uh, because we generate lots of waste. And the fleas can jump from all of the rats onto all of the humans congregating together and spread misery. Mosquitoes, another group of itchy insects. It often surprises people to learn that we had, we in fact have around 18 to 20 mosquito species that naturally live in Ireland. Most of them don't bite humans, and the few that do, like this Culex pipiens fly, seem to prefer going for other animals such as birds. A big worry is that exotic mosquito species, like this tiger mosquito, from Southeast Asia will be imported into Ireland through one of our urban city ports. And it's a big worry uh, precisely because mosquitoes are the deadliest animals on the planet. They kill on average 1 million people every single year by transmitting deadly diseases like malaria, yellow fever, West Nile virus, and other terrible sicknesses. Although it has to be said that our native Culex pipiens, which is the commonest mosquito in Ireland, this guy on the left, those species are also capable of transmitting West Nile virus too. We're just very lucky that we don't have a reservoir of diseases available for the mosquitoes to spread. Mosquitoes, like both of these species, breed in stagnant, oxygen-poor water puddles, so public health authorities are often on the lookout for malaria-carrying species in things like imported rubber tires, which retain puddles and travel over very long distances. 
In fact, we have already had an Irish malaria epidemic in relatively recent history. There was an outbreak in Cork in the mid 1800s, which is around the same time as our Natural History Museum opened to the public in the first time for the first time. Um, and the Cork malaria epidemic caused about a thousand cases in the area. It's thought that the disease was carried back to Ireland by soldiers returning from the Crimean War. And very interestingly, it's believed that the disease was spread in Ireland by one of our native mosquito species, this creature on the left, which is called Anopheles maculipennis, and not by one of the more dangerous exotic mosquito species. I focused on these past few urban insects because they're fascinating and because the suffering that they cause is often aided by some feature of the urban environment itself either because it's where people live in close contact with one another or because trade and imports from around the globe are greatest in our cities. But it's important to remember that the overwhelming majority of insect species are at the very least totally harmless or are in many cases completely essential for our own survival. For example, something like 70% of our crop plants are pollinated by insects. We don't pay them a wage or anything like that. They just pollinate our crops for free and we get to have the food surplus that enables us to live in large urban settlements. But it's not only pollination though, insects, if we leave them alone to develop robust communities of interacting species, they'll police themselves to a large extent. For example, even common wasps are excellent pest controllers and they'll devour plant pests like aphids and caterpillars and so on. Ground beetles too, they're excellent predators for slugs, snails, caterpillars, uh, other, pl other plant pests like that. Aside from that, insects are really important in breaking down organic matter like dead leaves or sometimes dead animals and recycling those nutrients into the soil, which of course enhances soil health. But they're also vital as a food source for other animals like birds, bats, uh, hedgehogs, badgers, lizards, frogs, and so on. Um, so in many ways, they're the foundation of a healthy ecological system. But apart from all that basic stuff, some of our most beloved luxuries are a gift from, from insects. For example, cocoa plants are only pollinated by tiny flies, such as chocolate midges. So if you stuffed your face with Easter eggs a few weeks ago, I hope you said thanks to a fly. Um, something that we think of as, as crucially Irish, something like the Book of Kells with its delicate squiggly lines. Uh, it's the famous series of medieval gospel manuscripts that are in, illustrated in that typical Irish manner. This would have been impossible without insects. The black ink used in medieval manuscripts, like the famous Book of Kells, is created by tiny little plant feeding wasps called gall wasps. The female lays her eggs inside the developing buds of an oak tree. And in, in response to this invasion, the oak tree then produces roundy galls, which contain defensive chemicals, uh, including dark colored ta tannins, which incidentally is the same thing that gives whiskey its kind of dark flavor or color, I mean. Um, and these chemicals and the galls trap the wasp larva in place. So when you break one of these galls apart, they, re they leak uh, a rich, bluey, blacky, inky substance, um, which was used to create these medieval masterpieces, including things like the Book of Kells. And it is also important to highlight that insects are legitimately in decline across the world, as far as we can tell. A recent torrent of scientific studies have highlighted alarming declines in insect populations, as well as in the numbers of species, <clears throat> i.e. biodiversity, from places all around the world. One of the major causes of biodiversity loss is, of course, urbanization itself. As our cities and urban areas grow more and more every year, they eat up more of the natural areas of countryside around them. And in doing so, they push biodiversity further away and further away from urban centers. This map from the European Environment Agency shows the urban sprawl in red of Dublin from the late 1950s through to the late 1990s. I couldn't find a more up-to-date map, but obviously that red area has at least doubled in size uh, in the past 20, 30 years. Um, and it's putting possibly more and more pressure on biodiversity. So it's something that we need to take into account if we're going to continue this urban sprawl, which we probably will do. That said, even some of the commonest insect species can create amazing spectacles in our cities. For example, later this summer, like every single summer, there'll be gigantic swarms of flying ants covering practically every footpath in Ireland. They're totally harmless. The swarms are huge mating congregations. Most ants don't have any wings, the workers. Um, but the future queens do, and the male ants do. When the temperature and humidity are just right, which is usually the end of July and start of August in Ireland, the ants swarm in what's called a nuptial flight. Males and future queens mate mid-air, and then they drop to the ground. They're clumsy, and they will land on you without hesitation, but they're totally harmless. They won't bite, and they're also in a mating frenzy anyway, so irritating people is the last thing on their mind. The males die very soon after mating, which to be honest is grand they don't do much in the hive and mating is their only purpose for life uh, but the females then go off and found a new nest as a new queen as a new queen um, and begin a brand new colony now that she's mated 
these swarms uh, frequently get so big that sophisticated weather radars mistake them for storm clouds coming in over the over the sea and over our cities. I think the flying ant swarms are proper wildlife spectacle. And, um, and do remember that the next time you read about killer ants, things like that, in all the red top newspapers later on this year. Other very cool summer swarms occur when aphids or green flies or black flies um, reach huge population densities after a good spell of weather. You can see enormous green and black clouds of tiny little insects literally containing millions of individual aphids flying around hedges and on, on city streets. Sometimes if you get on a bus or a train in the summer, you can see the tiny green aphids crawling all over passengers and you can tell whether someone's sound or not if they squish the aphid or sort of delicately pick it out of their, out of their jumper. Again, they're totally harmless unless you're a plant and they can cause a bit of vandalism if you park your car under a tree. Aphids feed on sap within plants and expel this waste as a sweet and sugary substance called honeydew. So if you park your car under a tree with millions of tiny aphids feeding and going to the toilet all over it, then the car will get extremely sticky and other things like pollen grains and so on will get stuck on the car and will absolutely wreck your summer if you have to clean it all the time. Honeydew is so sweet and sugary that loads of other insect species eat it as an energy source. Ants, in fact, love honeydew so much that, that they'll farm aphids. If you spot ants running up over a hedge and underneath a tree or something like that this summer, go in for a closer look and see what they're up to. Uh, chances are they're probably farming aphids. So very often they'll be guarding some aphids from a ladybird, which to us ladybirds are kind of charismatic. And as far as insects go, they're quite cute. But to aphids, they're vicious predators. So the ladybirds fly in and try and eat aphids, but then the ants will fight them off because obviously the ants want to keep farming the aphids for honeydew. So it's a little bit like in this scenario, ants are aphid, aphid shepherds. Aphids are kind of their sheep and then the ladybirds are the wolves trying to come in and eat them. It's absolutely cool. Anyway, it's just one of a thousand really great wildlife dramas that unfold probably every day in our cities. Uh, you just have to start doing things like turning over stones, kicking under hedges and flipping over logs and things like that to see some really cool um, nature documentaries unfold in, in real life. That's all I have time to briefly highlight for now, but I'll leave it by trying to encourage people to use Biodiversity Week as an excuse to get to know your neighbours a bit better. So I would say pick up that moth or spider or beetle or centipede or snail or whatever you find and have a good look, take some photos and try and learn the names of the species. You have nothing to be afraid of and totally unnatural urban environments. You will still encounter more species of insect than you could ever imagine. So thank you for tuning in and I'll stick around now to answer any questions that people might have. Hello and welcome back to our live Q&A. So I really enjoyed that talk, Aidan. Uh, what a great addition to uh, Biodiversity Week. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, again, good, good so, timing during Biodiversity yeah. Week. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. And I particularly, I really enjoyed the story about the cockroaches <laughs> and how the museum staff managed all those queries. I just like those little nuggets into the past are always fantastic. And I'm I'm sure there's similar queries coming in um, <laughs> all the time um, to you today. But um, before we jump straight into the um, q and A, I I just wanted to quickly mention one thing, which is the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss that began last Saturday in Dublin Castle. So this is a democratic um, process that involves 99 randomly selected members of the public. And over the next six months, uh, the, the, these public are going to learn um, as much as possible about biodiversity loss from different experts. And ultimately, the public will then, on behalf of the nation, make informed recommendations to the state so that our government and our politicians can improve our response, their response to biodiversity loss in Ireland. So if you're interested, I think it's really worthwhile checking uh, their website, citizensassembly.ie. I'm going to put it into the chat now, um, a link to the website. And on the website, you can see the whole process online. You can also view lots of interesting um, talks from experts on biodiversity uh, loss. And also, most importantly, you can make your own submission to the um, to the assembly for them to review. Um, so please, you know, check it out if you're interested. So, right, let's just get straight stuck into some questions. So I think the first one that we have that looks quite good there, Aidan, is from Emma, which is, what is one of the best ways for us to help manage our urban spaces to be greener or better for insects? Um, that's a good, a good question. And the answer is kind of in it, actually, to manage the urban spaces to be greener. So lots of plants. Um, 
especially if you're interested in things like bees. It's World Bee Day today, actually, um, during Biodiversity Week. And we know that in Ireland, we've got something like 102 native bee species. Um, there's something like 16,000 bees around the world, but 102 of them live in Ireland. And of those 102, I think 30% of them are, are threatened with extinction, uh, which is not great. One or two of them have already gone extinct. There's one that actually was thought to be extinct for 100 years, um, the tawny mining bee, but it's it's sort of made a bit of a comeback and it was rediscovered in Kilkenny in 2012. But um, if you wanted to help pollinators, for instance, and, and there's good reason to do so, um, obviously planting pollinator friendly uh, wildflowers, weeds, letting weeds grow a bit wild, um, things like that. And there's good resources. There's things like the All Ireland Pollinator Plan that have lists of of plant species that are great. It's not always just dandelions, and some of them do look nice if you're if you're into your gardening as well. I think dandelions look nice, but you know if you're if you're fussy like about your plants, <laughs> I love a dandelion. Um, so great. So yeah. So like less mowing of your lawn, just kind of supporting that bit of wild, even if it's just a corner of your if garden. You can, yeah, and of course as well, like it depends on what kind of biodiversity you want. You don't necessarily want to help things like mosquitoes and cockroaches and stuff like that. So if you want to get if you want to get rid of that kind of biodiversity, um. Yeah. I suppose well, cockroaches is uncommon. They'll show up if they show up. But the other one is mosquitoes. I have mosquitoes out my back garden. And it's because we have a water butt that's connected mm -hmm. to the drain. And it's like stagnant water in the top of it. And that's where mosquitoes obviously lay their eggs. So yes. um, clean that out. You can get rid of them or put up a bug zapper. But for the most part, we should be encouraging the wildlife that we do like, not the not the few that have become pests, I suppose. Very good. Yeah, there's actually an, an interesting an, uh, question here from Aileen, and she's um, saying, wonderful talk, Aiden. really enjoyed it. And what do you think about bug houses? Are they useful? Um, I think they are. We, we don't know a lot about them. It's kind of a new phenomenon. And uh, I do know that there is a research project being looked at at the moment, um, investigating bee hotels or bug houses. And I think looking specifically at bees and wasps and which kind of design of bug houses in Ireland works best uh, for, for you know species richness and that kind of thing yeah. um so they're definitely better than nothing i suppose the other thing is as far as i know a lot of the ones that you would buy uh commercially in in some of the, the larger shops they have like these bamboo uh little yeah. bamboo sticks that are glued in and i think ideally you'd want to get something that you can you can remove those and clean them because as the bees the stem nests and solitary bees will fly in they'll leave all their frass in there and then come out the next season um, but it'll kind of it can build up bacteria and do more and mold and things like that and do more damage and, and kill them off then but yeah absolutely they're, they're better than nothing yeah. and if you live somewhere that's very built up and there isn't a lot of space yeah um, or banks where bees and things like that and solitary wasps can go in a nest then then um i think they're great and if nothing else they're great to watch if you have one yeah. set up on like a south facing thing you can watch the bees and wasps coming and going Fantastic. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, um, like let your garden go wild a bit, but whatever you do to help insects, you still kind of maybe need to keep an eye on it, manage it. So like that things can you like go off or get diseases. So as long as you kind of yeah. give them a little I, help in hand. I like, think it's yeah. the same way, Jared, that you, um, you're supposed to clean out bird seed, like bird feeders, because they can go moldy as well. I think it's, exactly. it's probably the same principle with insects. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's really good to know. Um, somebody also asked, um, do you have a favorite insect species in Ireland? That's a hard question uh yeah there's one there's a really rare one i don't actually have a favorite one but there's one that i, I found recently that i think is really cool it's called the Minot minotaur beetle Um, i don't have one here to hand but I, I had a picture of one up on on twitter a while ago so you can find that Um, it's this cool it's a it's called the minotaur beetle it looks like it has these two big bull horns and cool. um, that come out of it and it's really patchy it's only found in a couple of sites in ireland um, and it lives in it makes burrows underneath dung underneath rabbit dung we think and then it goes about a meter underground and kind of lives most of its life as a, as a big larva underground um, but they're very cool looking things they sound great i'd love to see a picture of them i'll have to check out your twitter feed and like i love the fact that there's like so much in the soil that we just are totally unaware yeah. of <laughs> yeah we forget about it because we're not looking in under the ground a lot yeah. It's that other habitat that's so important. And um, there's loads more questions coming in. So, uh, um, yeah, so one from Helena. Is there any way of dealing with aphids for vegetable gardens that won't inadvertently harm other unsuspecting insects? So I suppose, I mean, what's the natural predator for aphids? Uh, ladybirds and wasps, yeah. And wasps. Um, well, I, th I think there's, if you want to get rid of it, I, I have a big aphid problem in my own garden as well. They're, as much as I like them, they're, they're annoying when they when they absolutely ruin plants. Yeah. Um, I haven't done it yet. I actually set up a bee box right beside it, and I'm hoping that it'll encourage wasps yeah. to go over. And then when, when they find the aphids, they'll, they'll munch on them. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, cool. But I, I read that you can get something like a, like a vinegar, some kind of vinegary mix, like vinegar and water, 
and kind of burn off the aphids that way rather than spraying pesticides that might damage something yeah else. definitely no pesticides please <laughs> um which obviously this person i think is aware of but yeah just yeah that there, there are some really good tips thanks emil um and then we have oh yeah so what um from michael what are some things the public can do with citizen science to record insects that they find in cities do you have any citizen science projects that you could recommend um, there are loads. So there's, there's the National Biodiversity Data Center would would manage uh, most of the citizen science projects for all kinds of wildlife, um, including plants and, and other animals, not just insects. But they do have a couple of initiatives that they run. They've got one at the moment, the flower insect timed count, the fit counts. So if you have 10 minutes to spare and you have a patch, it could be in a garden or it could be a local bench in a park. Um, or on a beach in the sand dunes where, where there's a bit of flowers. Any, anywhere, you just pick a, a, a patch and watch it for 10 minutes and count all the insects that come and visit it. Um, and the good thing is you'll, you'll get to learn the species over time as well. So you're kind of teaching yourself how to identify species. Um, because with, with somewhere between 12 and 16,000 insect species in Ireland alone, it can be a bit of a dark art, like, and it takes a long time to, to accurately work out what a lot of them are. So yeah, yeah. there's some easy ones to start with, like, some of the bumblebees and dragonflies and butterflies pollinator groups like those um are really accessible so that's a good one yeah the, the flower insect time count i'd say is a great one to start with perfect and we just put up a link to that and um and in the chat and also a link to the biodiversity data centers publications because there's some good reference to our like publications on the kind of like insects in your in your area and um, that will help you identify the insects in your cities and also emma just put up i think a link to um that minotaur beetle so that's great so thanks Emil, for doing that and um, so some more questions um are there some species of plant to avoid as they are invasive species we want to attract insects or as long as we can increase the diversity, is it better than nothing? So, I mean, I know we're definitely not experts on plants here, but um, off the top of the, your head, I suppose, is there anything that you avoid putting into your garden in terms of plants, or is it more you're just putting in the stuff that you know works for insects? <laughs> That's pr probably a question for a botanist. I'm, I, don't know much about, I don't know much about plants, only sometimes what eats them. Um, okay. I did things like, you know, rhododendron, obviously, are a bad invasive yeah. or... The, what is it the hogweed although you probably wouldn't have that in your garden unless you're very close to water anyway okay um yeah i don't know there probably are there's, there's probably a and you know if you looked up invasive species probably on again um yes. the biodiversity data website there's probably a whole list of invasive plants to avoid and the reasons to do so that's a really good point yeah okay another more insect related one are there any new species showing up in ireland in recent years due to climate change of insects that you'd be aware of yeah a few and actually if again for anyone who's on social media it's everything's really good time in this week and today jer it's because it's world bee day i did a series of tweets on the the dead zoo twitter and it's about bees mostly but mm. there's a few examples in there that i was just thinking about this morning of species that have shown up in the last year um, one that we were expecting for a long time is the ivy bee, um, Caletes heterae. It's a small little, um, small little uh, mining bee, and it lives in kind of sandy areas. And it was expected to show up again because of sort of a spread northwards through Europe, and it was spreading westwards in Britain. It was expected to show up eventually with, maybe with climate change or just with, with increasing temperatures, I suppose. And mm -hmm. sure enough, it did. It showed up last year in Wexford, which is exactly where you would show, kind of expect it to naturally show up. Um, and uh, there's a big colony of them living down there. So that was only discovered for the first time last year. There was another one, a giant bee called the Violet Carpenter Bee. Yeah. It's a huge, big thing. It sounds like a helicopter when it's flying around. And that was, that, it's a continental European species and it showed up in Ross Cray in Tipperary last summer as well. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't survive here or, or, or I'm not even sure if it lives in Britain, maybe down the, the very far south coast. There's dragonfly species as well that look like they've been tracking north over the past couple of years as well with with um presumably due to due to global warming water yeah. temperatures increasing um yeah there's new species show up in ireland uh, every year um and it's hard to disentangle what is caused by something like climate change and what's yeah. caused by something coming in and you know underneath a wooden pallet in a yeah. freight container or something like that Okay, yeah, so really good to know. And I suppose some people are kind of asking questions about, um, so like how important is it to report these different um, examples of insects coming in? Like, is it, is, it, is it worthwhile doing so? And like, what kind, is there, is there much work being done um, on um, kind of the insect diversity in Ireland as, as a whole? Like if, if people report stuff to the National Biodiversity Data Centre, it does get used, doesn't it, um, 
Aiden. It's really important. It does, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, they, they verify the data sets too. So the best thing you can do if you're interested and just want a new hobby as well is take pictures of insects that you find and record them on something like the Biodiversity Data Center. Or you can email them into us in the museum as well. We answer those sorts of queries too. Um, yeah. And often what the NBDC will do is they'll send a data set of all these species occurrences to somebody to validate. So it'll be an expert in that particular group of birds or insects or plants or whatever it is. And they'll be able to identify them often from the photos and say if they're legitimate records or not. So even if you're not sure you've identified something, yes. um, it'll kind of get, it'll get, it'll go through a bit of a mini peer review <clears throat> anyway. Yeah. Um, so there is that, there's that kind of casual recording. And then there are occasionally there's more targeted surveys as well. So I know there's, yeah. At the moment, there's a survey for the, again, Bee Day, for the great yellow bumblebee in Mayo. That's, I think it's a Department of Agriculture funded project uh, where that species, it looks like it's, it's it was once very widespread in Ireland and it's sort of been pushed to just the Western fringes and it's only it's only in Mayo now. But I think there's ongoing surveys for that. There's every every September, there's ongoing surveys for the marsh fertility, which are these fellows behind me, um, which is actually a, a one that I can zoom in just so people can see how nice they are. This is Ireland's only legally legally protected insect species mm. cool it looks like looks like stained glass in a church or something like that they're really beautiful it's cool. but um they they seem to be doing very well now in ireland and across here but they're legally protected under the habitats directive so all across the eu um yeah. and they're protected here so but every summer because it again it's a it's an internationally protected species they um there'll, there'll be surveys professional surveys done for those every year yeah um, and there's other ones as well like uh, building developments and so on if they've if they've employed uh, good ecologists to go out and do something like an environmental impact assessment if they've got biologists they'll often go out and screen for protected species and things like that as well to make sure that whatever development it is isn't going to um, negatively impact the populations yeah it's really important isn't it um so uh there's just another one i think this is maybe one of our last questions it's just um, from marin and they they're asking are there many insects that migrate to ireland like the monarch so slightly different question here but kind of interesting to know um, some of the butterfly species I can't think of off the top of my head. I always get confused between things like Red Admiral and the Painted Lady and stuff like that. But there's, yeah, some of our butterflies, again, not, not the monarch, although that has shown up as well a few times, oh, really? um, would migrate, migrate to Ireland. Yeah. Okay. Maybe some of the dragonflies as well, but I, that's a very good question. And I'm going to go and I'm going to go and read into it now. After this talk. <laughs> Me too, Aiden. Um, people are always keeping us on our toes, which is, is a good way to be. Um, well, we might just end on one last question, which is um, basically in terms of like, it, cause we were talking about insects in the city. Is there any kinds of insects in the city that roam at night that you didn't get a chance to mention anything in particular? A lot of them, yeah, yeah. Lots yeah. of moths, obviously, are totally nocturnal. Um, yeah. And if you leave on... Leave and is on. there any, like, like, yeah, is there any particular issue? Like, do they have any challenges, particularly, like, compared to other insects, I suppose, during the day? I know there's been a bit of research uh, on sort of things like light pollution and its po possible effects on moths. Okay. Um, I know they've changed lampposts a lot. Where I live, anyway, they've changed the type of lampposts. So back when I was a kid, there were those big, the ugly kind of orange lampposts. Yeah. Um, and I used to always see moths flitter it, like just going straight yeah. for them. And then if you're lucky, you'd see a bat kind of just realizing <laughs> that this is basically McDonald's. If you're a bat, they're just going <laughs> yeah. hoover them all up. Um, they don't do that as much anymore, I think, with the LED lights. Yes, There's a yes. good feeling. Um, but I'd have to look into that. That's probably a really nice research project for somebody to do if they're not there already looking. Know. I know they've looked at the impacts of light pollution on bats and yeah. and, and birds as well. Um, it, 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 kind of, it, it, it might simulate changing seasons and changing daylight hours and stuff like that probably is the same for nocturnal insects like moths and yeah. and, and lace wings and things like that yeah i'm always surprised by how many moths there are in ireland this you know we just don't get to see them as much because obviously we're asleep when they're awake and um, yeah. there's a last question which is going to wrap up our talk quite nicely and move us along here which is will, when will we be able to visit the museum again and uh, yeah, i suppose we are we're still closed the national museum of ireland natural history or the dead zoo is still closed to the public and we're working our way as fast as possible to open the ground floor again uh, hoping to that soon but we don't have um, a particular date ready yet so just keep an eye on our website guys and that's where um we will be informed um 
of when it is reopened. So I just want to say um, thank you so much to Aidan. Thank you so much for putting all that effort in for the talk and all your time. We really enjoyed it and it's great. We got loads of people viewing online today, which we're so grateful for, and lots of interactions. So thank you so much. And particularly thank you to everyone at home as well. And I hope you all have a fantastic biodiversity week. Um, so thanks, Aidan. Yeah, thanks, Jaren. Thanks for tuning in and, and asking all those good questions, everybody, too. It was really good. Um, okay, so I have just one small favor to ask you all, which is please take two minutes to fill out an online feedback form that is being sent to you now via, via Eventbrite. And then also please just check out our, our website, museum.ie, uh, for more upcoming events. Um, and also, if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, we have loads of other talks up there, including one that Aidan did last year on wasps, which is fascinating, um, and also from our other uh, curators at the museum as well. So that is really it now. We've run out of time. So thank you all so much, and a big thanks again to Aidan, and we'll see you next time. Bye.